Welcome to the Thundercast, your martial athletics podcast produced by the fans, for the fans, with your hosts, Russ Livingood and KD Hudnall. We're bringing you the thundering word on the thundering herd each and every week. So keep it right here. The Thundercast is on the loose. Thanks for downloading another episode of the Thundercast. You can follow us on Twitter at Thundercast underscore pod. Russ, the band is back together after a, a brief hiatus. Uh, and I appreciate uh, our buddy Jed Horton filling in for me. I have returned to the studio to uh, reunite with you and get back into the swing of things. Just a lot going on personally, which is why I was uh, out of the fray. So, again, I can't thank Jed enough for picking up my slack because, hey, man, Herd fans deserve to have a podcast every week, no matter really what's going on with either one of us. And it's really great to have somebody like Jed to be able to lean on uh, when we need somebody to help us out. Now, that being said, uh, I'm really excited to be back here because it's been a long time since I've been able to talk about the Herd with you. And and uh, it's been a little bit of a longer gap between shows not on purpose it's just kind of how things have worked out so that means we've got a lot to talk about and i'm going to get back into the swing of things with (laughs) who knows how many things that i get to talk about but hell let's get it rolling uh with a quick word from our sponsors at laser oliver plc you've been hurt in a wreck call the law firm of laser oliver plc find them at 304carwreck.com all right, man. Um, let's talk about what we've got to talk about. So start me off. Give me at least five things that every herd fan needs to know this week. Well, we always know it's at least five things, right? But uh, we're, we got a little extra here today. I'm not going to give you the number, uh, but it's not something out absurd like 35 things, even <laughs> though, you, you know, it's been a while between you and I getting together. We're edging that way. It's going to be one episode of things at some point, it feels like. Yeah. All right. Let's start off number one. This is something we've never, ever talked about here on the show. Abby Herring, right? Never, ever. never brought never brought her up. We jest because she is the singular athlete that has been mentioned more times in five things than we could ever care to count. But she did it again, man. You know, uh, while you were gone last week, we talked about her obliterating her school record. Uh, Well, she did it again by shaving off 15 more seconds now uh, down to uh, 1606. Her school record that she just broke last week, she brings home the gold medal at the Sunbelt Conference Indoor Championships in the 5K. Yep, that was the one, man. It was, if there, if there was going to be an individual SBC championship for Abby, it was going to be in this discipline. We talked about that when uh, I, I interviewed her and, uh, you know, she was gracious with her time and and she mentioned, like, this is the one I feel like is 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 my signature event and i would have to think that most folks in the um conference would have to have thought that abby was the odds on favorite to be the sbc champion in this discipline now if you saw the race it was it was nice it was it was a nice it took a nice effort for her to get that it wasn't a a runaway you know to use a bad pun she was challenged and uh she needed that new school record really to kind of make things happen uh, with more than a little cushion, you know, but um, you're right, man. It's, it's always great to talk about Abby and, and I know we've got more track and field to talk about because she wasn't the only uh, individual champion, but what a showing overall, you know, by this team, uh, the, the, particularly the women's team, they did really, really well, but not a shocker to start off our five things that every herd fan needs to know. By the way, brought to you by Ignite Link, the Tri State's premier IT management team. Can't forget those guys. Um, but just what a great way to bring get me back in the saddle talking about something I never get tired of talking about. Abby Herring, now an SBC champion. What a great way to, you know, kind of get ready to close out that career, that Hall of Fame career for the herd. All I have to add is 
one minute, two seconds shaved off last week, and then you think, man, probably can't get any better than that, and an additional 15 seconds. And guys, when we're talking about seconds, I mean, if someone breaks their record by a second, that's still very impressive. You know, it's the best they've ever run, and then they're beating it by a second. Five seconds is usually, wow, they they destroyed their record. An additional 15 seconds, one week after shaving off a full minute plus off there. So, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, number two, speaking of records, Paige Banton breaks the Sun Belt and school record in the 100-meter breaststroke at the Sun Belt Conference Championships for swim yep. and dive. I know, man. This seems like such a long time ago because there was so much going on in my life personally. But, uh, yeah, I was keeping tabs on this stuff. I was out of town a little bit. I was sick for a little while. And um, I was excited. We were really excited about heading into SBC championships uh, yeah. for the swim and dive team. And we thought, man, they could really make some noise. And they did make a little noise. They, 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 they as a team, they, they did really well. And this just kind of goes to show you, um, you don't want to call this program, because this is not an indictment of this current roster, this current coaching staff. But this was like just kind of a herd program. You know, yeah. we just had a swim and dive team. And incrementally over the last couple of years, we've gotten better and better and better. And this year heading into the season, uh, if, you know, some of our, our listeners are, will remember back in football season, we uh, happened to be tailgating next to Ian Walsh and, and the swim and dive teams set up. One, they were next to us one weekend. And I talked to him for a minute and he was talking about like um, how they were really expecting to turn a little bit of a corner this year. And we were singing that all year long. Folks, pay attention. Folks, look what's going on. Guys, pay attention. Paige Manton and, and, and uh, all these swimmers and divers that were swimmer of the week, diver of the week, pool record, mm -hmm. school record, personal best every single week. And for those that decided, all right, I'm going to pay attention. Well, I think you were treated to seeing the evolution of a program like in real time. It wasn't mm -hmm. just like hyperbole of us talking about what could be. It was actually happening. So not surprising that when it came time for championship week that we set some records. It, it, it almost became expected that there was going to be a record set. There was going to be some mm -hmm. championships won. There were going to be some podium finishes. It was going to happen. And it was, it's to, to kind of get that pool record, school record kind of thing uh, at, during championship week. I think it just, it means a little something extra. So uh, we knew there was going to be some, uh, some, some fireworks in this five things because championship week was for a number of our sports. And man, this might be the, the, the best one, you know, of the year so far because of, how we sh we went to these places and showed up on a team level and on an individual level across multiple sports for the herd. I am um, extremely proud of men's and women's track and field and the swim and dive team for how they um, competed and finished in a lot of areas during championship week. And Paige Banton for the swim and dive team, right at the top of that. So awesome to be talking about this. Yeah, so the very next thing is going to to be swim and dive as well. And uh, I just don't know another way to put this for number three is Grace Helsheimer put on a ridiculous yeah. performance um, at the Sunbelt Conference Championships in the one-meter dive event. Also in the three-meter dive event, she did very well in both of those. But let me tell you what she did. And I, I'm, no, I'm not going to pretend to be – knowing how scoring uh, goes, all the particulars go. But I know a record being broken <laughs> in numbers when I see it. So during the prelims, she set the new record with a 285 mm -hmm. point something. And then what did she do in the finals? 307. I mean, so when you talk about just the percentage leap of already breaking the record at 285, no one had ever broken 300. Right. Ever even come close to 300, and she does a 307. And she did over 300 in the three uh, 
meter dive event as well. She qualified for uh, uh, regionals. We talked about or the NCAA zone diving. Uh, mm-hmm. We talked about that while you were gone. Um, just an all around ridiculous performance, and we're here for it. Yeah, this is what I mean, right? You don't have to know the particulars of scoring, right? Very few herd fans are going to know that. But when you get an accompanying line of first ever to go over 300, that really tells you all you need to know. Yeah. I mean, because we've talked about this in the past, that when Marshall was a Southern Conference team, they had a very, very decorated and competitive swim and dive team. And to now in 2024, to attain these first ever to do something should resonate with you. And I tell you what, so many people, and I'm not saying they're right or wrong, so many people get hung up on successes and failures of football and men's basketball that they kind of let everything else just kind of fall by the wayside. And one of the most rewarding things about doing this show is that we have ourselves become knowledgeable and fans of track and field, swim and dive, women's basketball, right? Men's and women's soccer, all these other sports that have achieved to where it does like successes and failures and wins and losses of the football team each week or a losing streak or a tough loss by the basketball team. It doesn't like sour our week of herd athletics because we've grown to appreciate our other athletes, our Olympic sport athletes, our women's athletes in a way that we just didn't before because you and I were like the majority of herd fans. We live and died with football and men's basketball, right? Mm -hmm. But when you latch on to teams like softball, when you latch on to teams like um, women's basketball this year, men's soccer, which a huge portion of the fan base has latched onto that really helps to mitigate your just overall doom and gloom. Look when the football team's not going 10 and three, you know, if that's if, if, but if that's all you care about, then you're always just going to be, you know, disappointed unless your expectation is met. I'm telling you, it's a lot more fun to be a herd athletics fan than just solely a herd football fan or solely a herd basketball man you can yeah. be ridiculously passionate about them i'm not telling mm-hmm. you to to yeah. notch that down but i'm just saying allow the successes of our other programs to creep into your fandom and let you enjoy being a marshall fan more you know that's not some homer crap that's like legitimate stuff how could yeah. you not be excited for uh, the women's basketball team, 23 wins and at least a share of the regular season Sunbelt Championship as we speak. They can win it outright. And and Coach Kim said, we don't want to tie. We want to win it outright. So how could you not be pumped for that? How could you not be pumped for Abby Herring and Kylie Maston being individual SBC champions? And how could you not be pumped for Paige Banton and Grace Kelsheimer going out and doing these things in the pool that I couldn't do on my best day ever? But they're doing it in Kelly Green and White. Like, there are so many of these Olympic sports programs that are killing it that there is there is uh, there are easy pathways to being a happy herd fan at, at, at all. It's not it's not one or the other. You can still be pissed that we're on a six game losing streak in basketball, but still be really pumped that our runners are tearing it up at championship week. Our swimmers and divers are tearing it up at championship week. You know, and the women's basketball team is smoking the SBC right now. I mean, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both, right? And and that's where I fall. Like, it sucks to have to uh, see an underperforming men's basketball team, you know, because we know there are talented guys there, and we know that they want to win way more than you want them to win or I want them to win. But I can turn that right off and be like, Look at look at uh, Grace Kelsheimer doing some things over here in the pool. Look at look at Kylie Maston and that big smile, you know, like the final push, winning her SBC championship, which I know we'll talk about. But man, you gotta you guys gotta really latch on to being a herd athletics fan and instead of just a football fan, because there's a lot out there to be happy about. Quick little fact check. Only 21 wins so far for the women's basketball Sorry. program. Maybe you're, I'm thinking 23 wins it outright. 
Yeah, tw- well, one more win wins it outright. One more loss by Troy wins it outright. But they do have two games left, so they could win 23 for That's the That's probably what season. I'm thinking about. They're going to win um, 23 in I'm the regular have, season. I'm going to have a lot more to talk about when we get to the women about something that you just said there. So I'm going to. I'm going to just go and not comment right now so we can pick that up because okay. I think that you'll, you'll have some more that you'll be able to talk to me about. Number four here, we're keeping the theme with talking about women's athletics, but also women in athletics here. Number four, Kate Roll has been named manager of football operations for Marshall Football. Yeah, uh, just got the elevation just the other day. Uh, For folks that don't really know the intricacies of all that kind of stuff and who did what, this is the role that Joe Carter had when he left to go back to Mississippi State. So Katie was elevated to that role. She was on staff last year with like director of recruiting operations Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So this is just from going from director of recruiting operations to football operations. So this is Mm -hmm. indeed more than just a title change. There's a larger responsibility aspect to that role as well and it's and it's great to see our internal folks getting elevated doing such a good job that you don't go find an outside hire you promote from within that's something i really can appreciate about uh, huff and his staff that you know they go find talented people and then they try to retain those talented people and help them climb the ladder internally here at marshall so yeah this is a very heavily dominated women in sports episode so far man i awesome i mean this is great. A lot of championships and a lot and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, um, professional like administrative um, things that are dominating this show. This is really great start here. Just like our best friend Ron Pupil always said. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Number five, Bryn Brown is playing at the U.S. Women's National Team Open Program, and that's going on this weekend. Yeah, man, volleyball. About time for that to crank up. And I'm, I'm not trying to steal any uh, thunder away from uh, Bryn because she does a fabulous job, a huge piece to any and all success that herd volleyball has. Uh, but you know, we when it when it starts to get to be that time, uh, you start seeing the coaches tweeting a little bit more, and you know the uh, the herd just got bigger. Tweets start coming out, but this is a really um, impressive. Um, a- accolade for Bryn, you know, to 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 be a part in, of the uh, Team USA Olympic type discussions, uh, put positioning yourself to compete for those opportunities now and in the future. It does say things about herd volleyball, and uh, we we know, and and Coach Ari will be the first one to tell you that we've got a ways to go to be where we want to be, uh, both in conference and competing for a championship. We know that. We talked to her last year, and she was very open about it. Um, Did not shy away from any of those discussions, but we do have talented pieces that are here, and Bryn just proves that, proves that. There are other pieces that that performed well last year. Uh, Of course, we've we've lost some – pieces to graduation and, and things like that. And of course, most notably would be Lid Montag, who's now part of the softball team, who's getting game and stealing bases and doing all that jazz. So multi-sport athlete. I, I don't remember the last time that I can remember a, a multi-sport athlete. Uh, there may have been one, but in particular, as it relates to softball, we had um, a, a, a member of the swim and dive team that was on the uh, softball team several years ago. And, um, super cool to see that, but, um, Brynn is just a shining star for herd volleyball. So whenever she's getting this opportunity to compete for, you know, team USA type things, you gotta love it. I mean, what else can you say? You gotta love that. Seems like I remember over the last two years, um, every time you would check like leaderboards and things oh, yeah. like that in stats, she was always like near the top, even maybe nationally in, in uh, digs and, and things like that. And all these different things uh, just always the name that you heard, you know, uh, number six, we're going to move on for another thing uh, that is going to kind of a little bit. I'll tie that back into number five. Bear with me. Number six, Oliver Simla start for Philly Union last night. 
marked the first ever Marshall Soccer alumnus starting for an MLS team. And the way that I'm going to bring that back is both what Bren is doing and what Oliver Simla is doing. Two very different things on two very different platforms. But what that does is get eyes back on our programs here at Marshall. And you can say, you can come to Marshall and you can do this. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know how much uh, notes you have. Do you have more notes about the, the herd and the MLS? Uh, that we have three on the rosters yeah. right now. Um, yes. But this is the first ever start. Right. Yeah. But yeah. I, that's what I was saying. It's like we've had yeah. all these guys that we've talked about sign with various teams and various leagues. But we all know that it's about getting to that MLS, at least in American soccer. You're trying to get to the MLS uh, and, and three guys on rosters, you know, and Simla making his start first ever. That's that's a marquee moment for herd soccer right there. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's one thing to like, oh, we've got guys that got drafted. We got guys that are on rosters, but we've got a, a keeper that made his first career start for an MLS team that has Marshall University, you know, tied to it. And that's a that's a watermark moment for herd soccer. That's just the next in the evolution of where this program is going. You know, we've celebrated all the steps along the way, being really competitive, making a run, winning a national championship, number one for all these weeks, and winning the Sun Belt uh, Conference Championship and all these things. And then, you know, Matthew Bell with the being the highest rated draft pick for herd soccer ever and now it's this and now it's oliver simla making a first career start guys you, you follow the you can just see the road you can see the the cobblestones in the road right and and sooner rather than later this is all going to come back full circle for marshall you know uh, because think about it in terms of football which is easiest for most people to do you send guys to the nfl that has a direct tie and impact on recruiting it has a direct impact on um, donations it has a direct impact on notoriety to a program eyeballs on your program you know there's a lot that we can do and our coaching staff does just by going out recruiting and winning but it does take a certain element of putting guys in the pro ranks and having them perform and having people on broadcasts that are watching those games here Oliver Simla from Marshall University, Matthew Bell from Mar the rookie from Marshall University. It takes that, you know. Just just think about that. Whenever you would see, you know, Randy Moss highlights, and they would say Marshall University or Maud Bradshaw or insert the player, and it comes back to benefit the program. You know, think about Vinny Curry and all the things he did and being the Super Bowl champion. Then he comes back and you know spearheads this locker room project and has his name on it. You know, that that matters. Those things matter. So this is a big deal. Don't let that fly under the radar for a lot. of. I mean, herd fans should not let that fly under the radar. This is a big deal that, uh, that Oliver Simla made his first career start. That's a big deal. Yeah, uh, was with Louisville City last year, not in the MLS, had 31 appearances there. We figured it was just a matter of time with all the clean sheets that he was throwing up there as well and the praise that he was getting that he would make it to the MLS. One year, to me, that seems like a huge deal. And then I would be lying if I said I knew how many off the top of my head Philly Union has played so far in this season or whatever. But I know that he hasn't been with the club long. And to not be with the club long and already get a start as a goalkeeper, I think it's pretty impressive and indicative of what his career could be there uh, in the MLS. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how that works either, you know, from, you know, cause I don't want to look at it like a baseball farm system because it's not really the same thing. Right. But, just different leagues. But just think about how long it takes from a guy for a guy, like a really, really promising prospect. That's going to be a major league star someday. How long the progression takes to go up the ranks and make it to the final call up mm -hmm. and then stick and then play and then perform. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's a long process, you know, and soccer is probably more similar to baseball than it is to football because mm -hmm. it's college to pros and that's kind of it. And now you have the XFL and USFL and things like that. that kind of help developmentally and stuff. But even that's exceedingly rare. You don't see a lot of guys, you know, getting that call back up or re-signing into the NFL from those leagues. It happens. 
you know, Alex Millette did that. You know, he played and then went to Philly or not Philly, but Indianapolis and then, you know, uh, finished the season and then is back in the XFL. But that's that just, you're right. It seems like a very quick turnaround, like one season and then bam, now you're starting in the MLS. We could, I could be wrong, but it just seems like a very fast rise. Yeah. Uh, number seven, I've got uh, here a little snippet that came in. We don't have a ton of news from this, but uh, it appears Henry Baker has been targeted and for all that we know, it's been confirmed to replace the departed Chavis Jackson as cornerbacks coach. Yeah, There has been no official statement. I would wager that that will probably be weeks to maybe even a couple of months away before we get that confirmation, just the nature of the business and the timing of it. But um, Henry Baker comes from Maryland in that same position the last four years, and he was also a defensive backs coach with the New York Giants. Uh, previously right yeah this we knew it wasn't going to take long because when you start seeing the news of Chevis Jackson being hired by Miami that really didn't take long it was like it may yeah. happen oh it's happening bam and they announced yeah. him like two days later yeah uh, and all of a sudden the U is just turning into a uh, coaching staff full of former herd Marshall. coaches yeah I mean dang you know I mean of course coach Mirabal has been there for a long time well, mm -hmm. he's just he's been there for a long time, but he's been with Mario Cristobal for a long time, dating yeah. back to Oregon. Right. Yeah. So that makes at least by my count, at least three coaches. And there That's could three. be yeah. there could be more like administrative guys that I right. just haven't haven't dug into. Yeah. So that makes Mario or not Mario Cristobal, Alex uh, uh Mirabal, uh Lance Gidry, and now Chavis Jackson. Yeah. So Chevis Jackson did a great job with our DBs. We we sung mm -hmm. the praises of our young DBs cutting their teeth and looking different by the end of their by the end of the season than they did in the in the beginning of the season and even sometimes the middle of the season. He did a phenomenal job with our guys. Really helped uh, Micah Abraham develop into a sh true shutdown lockdown corner. The the final you know two seasons of his career did great with uh, Gilmore, the, his last season. So this is an important piece, right? We've got a lot of talent. It's very talented room uh, at Marshall. So you've got to bring the right guy in that can get more out of these guys than what they've already seen uh, because we know that um, we face some pretty good offenses in the Sun Belt, particularly in the Sun Belt East Division. Uh, you know, Georgia Southern is going to has been this air raid type offense and we've done really well against them. We've performed well against them the past couple of years. App State, it was it was a really good passing offense. JMU is a very good passing offense. So, it, you know, you're going to have to put somebody in there and get the most out of these guys. And you're right. You probably won't see anything official, uh, but, you know, you're in the midst of spring ball. So. Um, as long as you get somebody in there, as long as you get your guy in there and he can get to work, that's all that really matters. I don't care about a graphic. I don't care about an announcement. It's it's making the most of the opportunities right here because we've seen uh, how fast spring ball can get derailed just based on what's gone on in the Sun Belt Conference. And some of our conference mates have been absolutely gutted over the past week or so. Um, luckily, that hasn't hit us too hard. And you have to move quickly. And it looks like Marshall has moved quickly. So uh, we're just going to take it that we have a full complement of coaches and that they are steadfast into the midst of spring ball right now and just roll with it until we hear otherwise. I look for that announcement to be during spring ball is when, I mean, it just seems natural that they would do that because every time you have a hiring uh, um, announcement, there has to be the vetting and the process that they go through and all those things. We've seen it announced several times. It's like, we have somebody, there will be an official announcement. Uh, these things take time. Um, but I do want to say it's important to note with uh, Chavis Jackson being gone, we, we talk about the phenomenal job he did. But last year, he was also holding the title of co-defensive coordinator. True. So great job. He was here two years. He did a phenomenal work with our cornerbacks. Um, but co-defensive co coordinator uh, position. So that'll just be something that we can maybe keep an eye on as well. Will there be another, uh, you know, assistant defense coordinator, associate, co, whatever, you know, uh, with his departure. But that does it for our this week, seven things every Herd fan needs to know. And Jed, I did not forget you. 
uh, KD got got us picked up there. <laughs> um, just a little off my game, but as always, brought to you by Ignite Link. <laughs> it's no big deal, man. I threw you off of the off of the uh, the the. Uh, I, I see I've thrown myself off, but I threw your, your um, routine off by making a joke about a whole episode being full of things and just slipped your mind. But Hey, we got those guys covered because they got us yeah, covered. Uh, they got so, us covered. So again, since I'm just getting back into the swing of things, we're not really going to have any type of feature right now because I've, there was such a gap between episodes of getting me healthy and getting me back to where I could get behind the mic again, that I missed a lot of games and a lot of results and a lot of, a, a lot. So let's just go around the herd. Yeah, we're going to take it around the herd, and we're going to start with swim and dive and those Sun Belt Conference championships that we talked about earlier. They finished second overall to JMU. Uh, it is important, I think, to note, uh, just for accuracy, there are only four teams right now in the conference that participate in swim and dive. Uh, they are looking to grow that, obviously. But right now, even though we're saying second of four, you might say, oh, come on, that's the reason they got all these things. No, they progressed as the year went on. Uh, this, the things that we talked about up here, shaving their own records off. But, I mean, just the, the third and fourth place teams were not close to the second place uh, scoring that we did overall. All I'm going to hit is the gold medals on here. Uh, for this and the next segment that we're doing, or the next team we're talking about, uh, or if there was a record set. So here's the golds for swim and dive. Team diving, Grace Kelsheimer, Elena Lester, and Larissa Monksgard. Uh, the 800-meter freestyle relay was Molly Warner, Madeline Hart, Audrey West, and Esther LeBon. 500-meter freestyle, LeBon got that. And the 100-meter breaststroke, Paige Banton. We talked a lot about Kelsheimer. She did come in second there in the diving, uh, but qualifying for uh, the NCAA zones now in the one meter and the three meter and just obliterating the school records. To get to the 285, the announcement from the swim and dive team was that she shattered the record to get to 285 in the prelims. What's she do in the finals? Like we said, 307. So shattering it got to 285, above and beyond to get to 307. <laughs> you know the word I like to use, it's obliterate. So you shatter yeah. a former record and then you obliterate your shattered record. <laughs> so first off, uh, our first ever uh, 300 uh, plus score in the one meter and second time ever for 300 plus score in the three meter dive. So even though she didn't bring home a gold in that, she got a gold in the team diving and just set crazy records in, in the other two. So good showing by her all around, too. Yeah, good showing. All right, so track and field. We also had the Sun Belt Conference Indoor Championships. Here's the gold medals. Again, we had uh, the 5K for Abby Herring that we already talked about. In the mile, Kylie, you coined this nickname for her, Kylie Big Time Maston. Uh, took home gold. Tyra Thomas breaks her school record in the 60 meter hurdles, which she's been doing all year long. It was a fifth place finish. Mm -hmm. So uh, she was very close to, you know, those were all neck and neck right there. Uh, the year that she had in this event was just crazy good. You know, mm -hmm. I think the first seven that she participated in, she won. Uh, she gets here and she's been doing that all year, breaks her record. It was only fifth in the conference for this, but it just goes to show you how competitive these things can be because you're racing against yourself, but you're racing against the unknown until you face them in the conference championships. Well, and also what we don't know is how many of those runners that finished ahead of her also set a new personal best. You know, right. you, you don't know that. That's the right. that's the weird dynamic with track and field. I mean, I guess you could go back and go to, you know, James Madison's at website or what. You'd see. have to go, yeah, you'd have to research every single person on there. So you, who's to say, you know, but she had a phenomenal, phenomenal year. Great young runner mm -hmm. for the herd. Uh, this is a, this is a runner undoubt, undoubtedly that we're going to be talking about for as long as she's at Marshall. 
because the, the season that she had uh, and the, the progression, it just stands to reason that one of these times it's going to happen. You know what I mean? Cause mm-hmm. we, you know, we, we, we did, we didn't know what we didn't know when we started talking about Abby Herring and, and Kylie mass and all these seasons ago. And now look what that has turned into. They just have just continued to get better and better and better and championship this personal best that broken school record, this and all this kind of stuff. And it just feels like some of these young runners that we're going to be seeing being recruited to the herd under this new coaching staff. Remember, it's all brand new with, with well, it's not all brand new, but uh, with the, the director of track and field is brand new. This is year one. Uh, it just feels like over the course of the next couple of years, when you get a full recruiting cycle, like two, three years of a full cycle, not just a one year cycle, Marshall's competitively going to be vying for more and more individual and team championships. It just feels that way. If I'm mm-hmm. not mistaken, this was like the highest finish maybe ever for the women's team. Yeah, that was my next note on this. They finished four out of 13 teams, which that was a jump from last year. They were tied for seventh. Uh, so they this was a, a much higher finish this year. It's their highest conference championship score ever. So. Right. Talking about any kind of, you know, uh, if you, anyone is not familiar for where you place uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever, you get points in these events and everything. So the accumulated points was the highest score they had ever done in any kind of conference championship that's all over CUSA, Southern Conference, all that stuff. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. And we've also learned that Arkansas State is your – kind of the class of the conference when it comes to track and field from a team standpoint. Yeah. So, Men and women. Right. So if you want somebody that you have to point at and go, that's who we got to target, then that's the team you need to look at. As a herd fan, it's Arkansas State. Um, but you can't deny. They had a great showing, all-time best showing for the women. Uh, could have been better for the men, but you know it, this is building blocks, right? This is, mm-hmm. You're talking about going up against teams from the South. It, it's always going to put Marshall at a disadvantage. <laughs> you know, geographically, because recruiting uh, is just different in the South when it comes to sports like that, like baseball, like softball, like track and field, like golf, right? It's just easier to recruit those sports in the South. And being that we're always going to be up against some more Southern teams, it's always going to be more of an uphill battle. So doesn't mean that Marshall can't go out and win because we are. It's just going to take us a while to get a, that nucleus in place. And and you can't say that we're not in the right direction because we absolutely are. We are 100% going in the right direction. So I'm really proud of both our men's and women's team. I'm really proud and thankful for our coaching staff for fielding these teams, training these men and women, and getting them to peak at the right. Every time we thought they were peaking, there would be another peak the week later and a week later. Yeah. So I'm really thankful for them. I'm really glad that I, as a fan, started uh, paying attention to her track and field because it's just been really fun. The progression has just been really fun to keep track of. And, of course, now I'm just a little bit spoiled, and I expect more next year, you know, I, I just – and later, I guess later this year maybe. I don't know. Yeah. So the men did finish seventh out of seven teams, and that's their second straight – uh, in the Sun Belt being seven out of seven. This is their first or second year back, mm-hmm. right? And they have not been um, a full year um, with the the new coach. He was named in July. Uh, when they did the, uh, hey, we're coming back, I mean, that was late in 2022. And then you have twenty early 2023, just weeks after they came back, they're participating. Uh, and then the Sunbelt Conference uh, indoors are early in the year. You know, it's February here that we're talking about this. So uh, they have been right around a year back, right. you know, give or, give or take. Uh, so you can't just say, well, they finished seven out of seven. They're just not getting it done. It's going to take a little bit of time. These guys a, a year ago were just fresh being here back in this uh, – uh, track and field event. And, uh, I think that as we recruit and we try to get more of those that are playing football as well, that will be running track. I think that you're going to see us move up very quickly. Uh, now that you have 
a uh, an overall track and field director and you've you know you've got someone uh, doing the long distance stuff someone doing the sprints the different things on here I think that th- what we have in place now you're going to see a lot of growth for the men and the women yeah I'm, I'm going to say something that a lot of fans hate to hear but it doesn't change the fact that it exists and this is what it is it's a process right you mm-hmm. don't very rarely do you just start a program or rekindle a program and then just have instantaneous success. Yeah. And if that, if that happens, great. I mean, it does. Our women's basketball team proves that it can happen. You have a coaching change, and then bam, you go out and have a phenomenal championship type mm-hmm. season. So it does happen. But what I'm saying is, by and large, it's a process, and you have to buy into the process, and you have to be okay with the progression. And mm-hmm. you know, the, the point of contention comes then. Well, when has the process taken long enough, and we're not seeing the results that we wanted to see? We're not there with men's track and field. By a long shot, you know, yeah, Keith, is, Keith Roberts has not been here. Uh, he's been here barely over six months. Yeah, right. So let's let, let's not just, you know, we're not trying to say, hey, we're fine with a seven out of seven finish. We're I'm not fine with that, but I understand it's a process. But I am fine with the highest ever finish for our women. Is it it's only fourth? OK, they missed the podium as a team, but it's still the highest ever. So next year you're shooting for a podium finish. Right. That's the process. So I'm yeah. cool with it. I'm cool with it. Mm-hmm. And you talked about Arkansas State for the men and the women. This was the fifth straight championship for both of those teams. Uh, they are obviously the class of track and field in the Sun Belt and who everyone is chasing. So sure. it, it's not just us saying, well, you know, we're we didn't win. Well, there were 12 other women's <laughs> teams or 11 other women's programs yeah. teams that were looking up as well. All right, we're going to move on to tennis. Uh, the herd loses seven to nothing to Northwestern on uh, what was that? I think that two sixteen with the lone bright spot being uh, Johanna Strom and uh, Emma Vander Hayden blanking the forty eighth ranked doubles team in the country six to nothing. So someone immediately might say, "How did we get shut out seven to nothing when we had a win?" That was our lone win. You get one point for overall in doubles. We lost the others in doubles, so Northwestern got that point. Um, we then won a close 4-3 to three over Illinois State on uh, February 17th. The team victory came down to the very last point, game, set, and match on a Sophia Hurion singles victory. Uh, she won 7-6, to six, so, you know, it was tied wow. and then, yeah, so it all hinged. That's how close it was on this. Uh, and then on the last day of this Illinois road trip, it was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all in the state of Illinois, uh, the herd lost 4 nothing to Illinois. Uh, then yesterday they lost 5-2 to two at Maryland, and that closed out their out-of-conference play. Yeah. Now, it's a lot of losses there, three out of four in these uh, last uh, eight days that we were talking about here. But one, great programs that they went up against when you start looking at how these other teams were ranked. Uh, Two, I would imagine that it is ridiculously hard to go to Illinois for Friday and then a different part of Illinois on Saturday and a different part of Illinois on Sunday, all away from home. Uh, But coming into that, they were on a very good win streak going into this road trip and, uh, Going into conference play, I'm confident that they're going to make some noise just like they did last year. Yeah, I think they will too because we saw that uh, uh, like a mid-major top 25 ranking from for Mm -hmm. herd tennis, and you know last year it was kind of a I don't want to call it a three-team race, but it was it was it was Old Dominion and James Madison and Marshall most of the season, and and we we did really well in the conference last year there is no reason to think we're not going to do really well again this mm-hmm. season and when you look at it you got to circle the matches with old dominion you got to circle the matches with james madison and that's kind of where the separation's going to occur if if it's going to be a three team race again then those are the ones you got to have because those are the separators those are the differentiators a term that i generally use for academics but that's what it is so I, I, how can you get upset when you're talking about facing a team like Big Ten teams in country club sports? You know what I mean? That just seems like, well, they're probably supposed to dominate that because they're ridiculously funded and they're, you know, such prestigious academic schools 
And that's the type of athletes by and large that you attract in the, into those sports, you know? So it, it doesn't surprise me that, um, you know, you, you, you take a couple on the chin to teams like Maryland and Illinois and Northwestern, you know, it, it, that, that, that doesn't surprise me at all. And it also wouldn't surprise me if there were like, like nationally ranked players that play for those teams. It's just kind of seems like the way it would be. You know what I mean? So now we just, you know, drop back, punt, regroup, and ready to run through the SBC because that's what really matters. Yeah, and a little bit of a note here. I've got the uh, conference standings up for 2024, and no one in Sunbelt has played a conference game yet. That's coming up next week, uh, maybe next weekend. It might be the weekend after that. Uh, but Georgia Southern right now is 10-1, and one, so they're – quote the leader uh but these are so hard to rank because who did who play and that sort of thing but what i want to say is marshall has the second most wins at nine and five uh but most everyone else has only been in six to nine matches coming into this Mm -hmm. so the scheduling it looks like we have amped up to go play these harder opponents and to do these harder road trips and i feel like that is the kind of thing that will prepare us for conference play because yes people are noticing nationally that rank this type of thing people that know tennis are saying hey marshall is looking impressive it's because who they're playing and the performances that they're doing against that so don't get caught up on well, we lost three of our last four. It's probably not going to be a good conference season. Like I said, I look for them to make noise because of what they've been doing. Yeah, me too. I mean, I you have to expect that the herd would finish in the top three because that's kind of where it went last year. And you're a, you're a match here or a match there from being in the you know SBC championship type match. So let's just see how it goes, man, because I like our chances. These next couple of things are just uh, things that we have upcoming or going on. Uh, Men's golf, the Loyola Intercollegiate, is at Goodyear, Arizona uh, today, Sunday through Tuesday. And women's golf, the GCU Invitational at Grand Canyon, uh, is on Tuesday and Wednesday in Phoenix, Arizona. This is a part of that herd taking over Arizona. Our softball program's down there right now. we got men's golf, women's golf going on there uh, this weekend in the next couple of days. But uh, be looking for the next time that we have a show. We'll have the results here for the men and the women. Cool. Yeah. Went, went, women coming off that amazing uh, performance, uh, with Emily McClatchy uh, tying to win that uh, their only uh, only golf outing that they've had this year. Cool. Yeah, man. Uh, men's soccer got a couple of things here. They're hosting Athlete Institute Football Club on Sunday at 1 p.m. That's an outfit out of Canada that we played uh, them last year during the Spring League, I believe, is kind of an exhibition or a thing to start up. Uh, Next Saturday's match hosting Ohio State in the Spring League has been changed to a 1 p.m. start time. Uh, For these, donations will be taken at the gate. So if you do want to go, there's not assigned seating. It's just first come, first serve. They're asking for donations at the gate. Concession stands will be open. Um, That's about really all I have to say about these events. They probably are not going to have articles uh, based on like who scored what or whatever. So if I get to go to these, I will take those notes and provide those. If not, I'm going to lean on our listeners and viewers to kind of help us if you were there. Uh, so feel free when you go to these. I know we got a lot of soccer uh, fans here in the tri-state area. Yep. If you go to these, send us a little note on uh, on things that you saw, and we'd be happy to talk about it on the next show, just in case I don't get to go to them. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's your first opportunity to go out and see this new herd team, you know. And over the past couple of years, this the spring league thing is just kind of something we've wanted. We've we've wanted to win for some bragging mm-hmm. rights and. Uh, we did it. We were able to do it a couple of years ago. We we're not able to do it last year. So, uh, I mean, go out. Hoops Family Field is really cool. I know a lot of folks have gone and, and watched matches there, but mm-hmm. it's a really intimate place, and it's you're right on top of the action. For folks that have never gone and see this as an opportunity, like, hey, this is free, or I can donate a buck or whatever to get yeah. in. 
yeah. like go check it out because I guarantee you you'll like it because it's very uh, exciting and there's 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 just a wave of energy that's ever present because the place is so small and so intimate and you're right on top of everything and I guarantee you if you go it will um, coax you into going back to a match w when the regular season starts. So if you yeah. got nothing to do, I mean, dang, you know, on the second, um, go check it out. Go check yeah. it out. Today's is going on right now as we record. Obviously, I'm not going to get over there. I'm just sitting here looking. I'm like, hey, it says Sunday. Well, that's today, and it's at yeah. 1 o'clock, which is coming up here in mere minutes. Um, moving on to baseball, just the nature of how we had to do with uh, last week's show ended on Thursday is when we recorded. Uh, so Friday was the very first game. We got a lot to cover in baseball. It's two different weekends worth of games. So we were swept by College of Charleston last week in the first four games of the season. Again, do not let that discourage you because College of Charleston is always good in baseball. Uh, we lost 15 to three, five to nothing, two to one, and eight to five in the four games. Uh, kicked off this weekend series in a much better fashion <laughs> with a 20 to 10 shellacking of Michigan State and the Snowbird Classic. We were up 20 to three in the seventh inning yeah. until they put uh, five and then two up in the eighth and the ninth to make it a. <laughs> Not even respectable, but at least they made it to double digits against our 20. Um, they had a double header uh, yesterday against Indiana State. They lost in 10 innings, 5-4, to four, uh, after taking the lead in the 10th. Uh, and then Michigan State beat them 6-2 uh, to two yesterday in the nightcap. They are playing Indiana State starting at 1 p.m. Again, first pitch is here in just a few minutes. Yeah, I can't get a gauge on this team, man. I know it's early in the season, but what a roller coaster to go, eh, man, lost four straight, and then you come out and put 20 runs on the board. Like, what the hell? You know, and then another rough go of it. But uh, I will say this, um, edging really, really close to the home opener. So... Uh, it feels like no matter how this season goes, I mean, we do not have a clue of what this season is going to look like. To me, of course, I want to win games. I'm not trying to sound like I don't care. But this whole season, I don't care if Marshall goes on and wins the College World Series. This this whole season will be remembered for the inaugural game at Jack Cook Field. That's yeah. what it'll be known for. Mm -hmm. And I cannot for the life of me believe that they got all the way down to single game tickets being available for that game. I, it, that is shocking to me. I thought for sure that this would be gone. Those tickets would be long gone by the time, you know, they were able to get to single game tickets. So that tells me one thing. Um, there are still too many fans that are playing wait and see for some reason. This is a decades long, like once in a lifetime type thing. And I don't know why you would care if, if uh, this team is like undefeated or Owen, whatever, by the time that game runs around, this is hurt yeah. history. Yeah. Get your ass out there. Go buy the ticket. I don't care what it is, man. Go buy the ticket. And of course uh, we, I got a good time to say this now, of course, of remind folks that we, Bought season tickets for baseball, so we're going to have tickets uh, to that game to give away. And um, so be on the lookout for that. I don't know exactly what we'll do. This is a very special game, so I don't know exactly what we'll do or how we'll handle that. But all season long, when the herd is at Jack Cook Field, we are going to have tickets for those games. Yeah. Um, if you're going to be looking for something cool to do all spring and into the you know late spring, um, we're going to have tickets for herd baseball. So just a note of that, but I cannot get past a 21 or a 20 run outburst against Michigan state. And I would like to say that officially, uh, Michigan state has, uh, been invited to join the diamond sports of the Sunbelt conference because Marshall has dominated them both in softball and baseball. And I think because of that, they have respectfully declined and are going to stay in the big 10 whatever don't be uh like 
trying to steer clear of the herd just because you took a couple of L's on both diamonds, but 20 runs is pretty damn impressive. I don't care what I don't care what you say about that. Yeah, think of this perspective. In their one win and they one win, they scored 20. In their six losses, they have scored a combined 15. Right. So, uh, you know, two and a half ish uh, runs a game in their losses and 20 in their one win. So that just tells you, you know, if you're not even familiar with stats and things in baseball, <laughs> if you score 20, it's a very good chance you're going to win. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So moving on to softball to keep it on the diamond, they uh, won seven to one over Fair- Fairfield last Friday in the first game of a doubleheader. They won the second game against Longwood six to three, beat Longwood again Saturday morning six to two. Lost on Saturday uncharacteristically to ECU thirteen to one, but they bounced back on Sunday for an eleven to two victory. Four and one last weekend put them back over. Uh, they were two and three the previous weekend, so that gave them a winning record. Uh, they started off this weekend with a seven to three win over Drake and a twelve to four loss to the number twenty three ranked in the nation, Arizona. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they led a couple of times early in that game. It just seemed like they had uh, a big inning that uh, blew up on them that they couldn't overcome. And then they beat Central Michigan uh, four to nothing, and then lost to Arizona again ten to two last night. They were again right neck and neck with them. Gave up some runs, couldn't keep up. They are. Going right now, KD, as I say this, hopefully you'll have an update on the score for me. It was 9-3 to when I started uh, this show, but uh, they are right now going up against former head coach Shonda Stanton's Indiana team. And what's the score right now? It's a final. Uh, Indiana takes the game 12-6. to And I know that's a little upsetting, but remember this is a uh, really good Indiana team as well. Yes, yes. Um, and this was a this was a special one because Shonda was Morgan's coach at Marshall, mm-hmm. so th- that was that was uh, I'm sure special for her on a personal level. She probably really wanted to get that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but look, Marshall did okay. Here's the thing, Russ. We had a we had at least three. I lost track. Really, we we had at least three uh, home runs in this game. All of them were solo shots. So mm-hmm. that's just a kind of like dang it type deal because you know. Yeah. 12 to 6, if you got a couple of base runners on, you know, all of a sudden maybe it's a 12 to 9 game or Mm -hmm. you make a play here and there. You know, it's just not as bad as it seems. But Mm -hmm. uh, Indiana busted out for like a seven run inning and kind of blew the game wide open. Heard clawed back in it. It was, you know, three to two and then seven to three. And then, you know, they, we just kind of, kind of went, you know, run for run after that and just couldn't close the gap. But I'm telling you, Sid Bickle's killing it. Nine hits this weekend. A uh, couple of home runs, I think. Mahala, K. Mahalas had a home run today. Um, I, I'm turning quickly in. I tweeted this last night. I'm turning quickly, very quickly, into a Kasia Parks fan. She's a newcomer to the herd. Members came over from Western Kentucky. Um, plays center field for the herd, replacing uh, the you know graduated Grace Chelleman, who was, did a fabulous job in center field for the herd. Kasia Parks is turning into one of my favorite players on this roster because she is an absolute – defensive gym out there. And, uh, you know, yes, that's always going to be near and dear to my heart, a center fielder that gives up the skin for the ball and makes the diving catch. It has no fear out there because um, not I was I'm never going to be as good as these collegiate athletes. But that's what I played growing up, you know, and that's what I like to do. And, and so, you know, you always pull for the players that played the same position as you, you know, and. Kasia Parks is a really, really bright spot for the herd. A lot of these newcomers to the herd have been impactful. Uh, we we've we wondered, you know, and you talked about this a lot. You can't really go off of numbers at your former stop as a sole indicator of what you're going to do with Marshall. Uh, Kasia Parks played quite a bit at Western Kentucky, and we're really sure, you know, well, how's it going to translate? Well, she's been a defensive gym. She gets on base. You know, she scores runs. She does what exactly what you were hoping to see. Bella Gerlach's another one that has been performing at a high level for the herd. Um, and I think you really have to um, look at Sid, Sid Bickle and go, you know what? She was really deserving of that preseason first-team all-conference. She is killing it, man. 
The defense is uh, notched up again this year. Offensively, she looks like she's hitting with more power. We saw our first glimpse uh, or another glimpse of the of the latest installment of Triple Bickle this weekend. It's a lot to be happy about. And um, even though the one loss record isn't going to be as inflated as it was last year, we talked about it. We're playing a tougher schedule. They're mm-hmm. going to be battle tested. They're going to mm-hmm. be uh, galvanized in, you know, in the fire by the time the SBC season rolls around, because it's going to be tough, man. Louisiana is really good again. James Madison's going to be improved uh, over last year. App State's going to be good. There's a lot of teams that are going to be really, really good. Um, and Marshall's going to need to be able to keep pace. And, and, and we're going to have to do it in a different way than we did last year. Right. We've, uh, we were, I was talking online just a little bit ago with uh, some folks and, and, they were. They made the point about it doesn't appear that we ha- are st- stealing as many bases, and you know I was like, well, I, I really don't know. I haven't paid attention to that, but I started thinking about why, and it got me to go down the pitching rabbit hole. And all of 2023, Russ, this is something that I didn't know, right? So until I went down this rabbit, we pitched five pitchers in 2023 the whole season. That was it, mm-hmm. and the the. L- Far and away, the lion's share of those innings were by Sid Nestor. Um, And a very distant but yet still impressive second was our now Friday, Sunday, Savannah Rice. The the other three pitchers on the roster that we used last year only combined for 42 innings the whole season. And Bub Faringa pitched a lot of – she was number three in innings pitched. And now she's like – one of the top two pitchers, right? Right. This year, we've already used four pitchers, and those four pitchers, the bottom two of those have combined for 17 innings already. So you can see it's a different type of thing. It's totally different. You talk about 42 innings over the course of a season for your, you know, your two or your uh, three, four, five innings pitch pitchers last year, and now already 17 innings pitch for your bottom two innings pitch pitchers this year. So having somebody like a Sid Nestor just allowed you to be far more aggressive because you knew she was just going to be dominant in the circle. Savannah Rice is doing really well this year. I'm not trying to take anything away from her. But having a luxury, the, the, an utter luxury, like a dominating power pitcher like Sid Nestor, it just allows you to do things on offense that maybe you have to tweak your game plan a little bit. And let's not forget Morgan Zirkle's not – Megan Smith, they're two different coaches. Their philosophies are different. And we yep. heard Morgan say, we're going to do what we need to do to win. We, if we mm-hmm. hit, if we're living off the long ball, we're going to continue that. If we if we have to run bases and put pressure on the defense, we're going to do that. So you can't just compare the two teams and say, well, this, you know, we're, we did this more last year and not as much this year or vice versa because it's completely different philosophies. A lot of different players, a whole lot of different players. And – Ultimately, I'm still very satisfied with the product that's on the field right now. And they still have to learn who they are as well, right? I mean, how many games are we into the season? I don't know the number, but but it's not a lot, right? There's a, there's yeah. a lot of, lot of uh, softball to be played. And just like your football team is generally a different team in the end of the season than they are at the beginning of the season, so too most likely will be the softball team. Yeah, eight and seven record against the schedule that we've had so far, I think, is uh, very good. And also, a couple of those games, again, it just seems like an inning here or there that has been what yep. has killed us. So, you know, it seems like that dominant pitcher, like you're talking about, uh, could have been the difference in this. But also, you know, without being able to watch every single game, because not all of them have been on ESPN Plus or some other network where you could watch them. Uh, it could have been just a defensive gaffe here and there, uh, things that aren't going to happen in every single game that has allowed the the runs to stack up and be an insurmountable uh, gap for them to to close to get these victories. But eight and seven with the record um, against the teams and the schedule that we've seen coming into the season, I would have thought if you get out of those first three weekends with a winning record, you've played some good softball. And I like what uh, what they've done so far. Well, and, uh, and what you have to say, every game is a road game. All of yeah, them have been yeah. a road game. doesn't matter if you're the home team. You have not been at Dot Hicks Field once yet. That's that, coming up. 
that was my next thing to say is every game has been on the road, but finally on Wednesday at 4 p.m., they will be going against Bellarmine. Again, Kyle Walker, I said it right, <laughs> Bellarmine. Uh, Bellarmine, 4 p.m. at the dot for the home opener on Wednesday. You yeah. need to be there to support this team. Uh, I plan on being there. Uh, look for me out in the outfield if you want to talk some Marshall softball. Yeah, that'd be cool, man. It's it's still it's – still, what time is it getting dark up there still? Are they going to have to kick the lights on already? Maybe by the end of the game, you're looking around six-ish or something, so if the game doesn't start exactly at four and if the game goes a little bit long, I would say that they usually in games that I've seen, they try to kick the lights on a full 45 to 30 before it does get dark or yeah. whatever. Uh, so we might see the lights come on for the first time uh, <laughs> for a game you know, as early as this Wednesday. It's super cool, man. Get out there. Get to the dot. This team is – they would. you really just owe it to them. And I know we talk about this being a different team from last year, but there are a lot of players that were on the team last year that returned this year, and you just owe it to them to get out there and pack the dot, give them that – what is it? Dot magic for the first mm -hmm. time. Set the tone early in the season that this place is going to be – packed full you are going to have a big crowd to feed off of every time you're at dot hicks field they deserve it they absolutely deserve it now we're going to switch over to men's basketball and just to preface this we recorded last thursday jed and i and it was before the game had started so we're talking about all the way to last thursday when we start talking about these results here uh, they lost on the road that night to App State, 73-58. to 58. They lost mm -hmm. uh, on Saturday at Coastal Carolina, 74-67. to 67. Got blown out at home versus James Madison on Wednesday, 84-58. to 58. Terrible, terrible loss. And then lost last night to App State at home on a game that had been elevated to ESPN2, 65-58. to 58. They are on the road Wednesday at 7 p.m. facing Georgia Southern. This makes uh, five straight losses that they're in right now, six of the last seven that they have lost. Yeah. They were on a, on a decent little run there for a while and then have lost six of the last seven. Yeah, it's it's this is not what you want to be trending at the end of the season. The, the Georgia yeah. Southern game, the last game, right? So um, Marshall two, is – Two games left. Oh, there's I'm two sorry. games yeah. left. Okay. Yeah. One, there's one in March. I'm sorry. Yeah. So you got two games left on the schedule. You're 12 and 17. You're going to finish under 500. Yeah. And, um, you know, we got into a little bit, not really a dust up, but there was a lot, you know, how, you know how folks are. Yeah. You know, they, there's a lot of vocal fans out there. And, you know, they're like, we, th something's got to change. Something's got to change. So, and whenever they say that, what they mean is, I want a new coach. That's what they right. want. That's what they're saying. Yeah. So they just won't say it. They just say something's got to change. And this seems like a good time to remind people, which I did on Twitter last night, that Dan Tony signed a three-year contract extension last March. So this is year one of a three-year extension. So here's mm -hmm. what – basically here's what your options are. If you're in that I want to change camp, Dan's got to retire because we're not going to buy out two years of a three-year contract and then have to go sign a new head coach with a contract. So it's not going to happen. OK, it's not going to happen. So, you know, I, and too many people equate like I just got directly asked and I answered for both of us because I know your answer. I got directly asked, do you support Dan Tony? Of course I do, because I support we support Marshall basketball and it doesn't mm -hmm. matter who the coach is. We support Marshall yeah. basketball. Right. And it's not this one or the other thing. It's not like, oh, well, you support. This coach, so you're okay with a losing record then? No, not at all. I, don't, um, I am absolutely not okay with a losing record. But if we if we play Parcheesi, I want to win. All right, I want to win every freaking contest. I want to win every match, every uh, competing event that we do in every sport. Uh, but it does not mean that when you go on a losing uh, streak that you just say, oh, well, this coach is never going to win again. They'll never have another thing. Um, 
we set a record for wins last year and the uh, competition was not as good as what it is this year. Yeah. And we lost three of our five starters. Two of them transferred and hit the portal, uh, yeah. which both both were unexpected. One was a lot later than the other. Um, and then we lost our all-time leading scorer. Yeah. We had to bring in a bunch of guys that I will remind the fans – uh, particularly some that have switched from one burner to another. Yes, uh, it's not that hard to figure out who these people are. Uh, but they said, well, look at these transfers that we brought in. These transfers are trash. These guys are are not going to be good. We're going to have – I'd be surprised if we win eight games this year. All the different idiotic things that somebody might say, you know. <laughs> and, hey, it says it right here, at Russ Living Good. Feel free to, you know, <laughs> call me out on this. But if you say something idiotic, I'm going to say that's an idiotic statement. So to say things like we won't win a game or we'll be lucky to win five games or this is going to be the worst squad that we've ever had and all these things. And then early in the season after the game at Queens, uh, pronouncing a certain player as he is all caps him you know just <laughs> just because he played it and this is one of the guys you were saying wasn't going to be good for us and then we start to have a winning record and playing good basketball and you're all on the train of saying man i was wrong or not saying i was wrong because they never say i was wrong they'll say man this team is surprising a lot of people <laughs> and you know i'm on board and i think you know blah 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 and then you hit a losing streak and all of a sudden you're like nope these guys are horrible. Uh, none of them would start on any program. You know, all the different idiotic things that you hear. Stop. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> yeah, it's a bad season. Quote this. This season is nowhere near what we yeah. want to see. Right. This season, any losing season, is nowhere near what we want to see. That does not mean that we say, oh, well, I'll never go to another game. I'll never support another thing. We're going to buy every season ticket that we can. We're going to go to every game that we can. We're going to be there cheering on the team. And that's when teams need us the most because we cheer for the M that is on every um, uniform, every door, every all over campus. We're cheering for that team. And if they are losing – I'm sorry. I'm going to cheer that much harder. I'm not going to say, oh, we had we lost five in a row. That means obviously we got to can somebody. Now, has this been absolutely horrible basketball? Yes. Do I agree with the rotations and, and the uh, sticking to a certain game plan that's not worked over the last five games? Yes, I've been disagreeing with that. Could that guy out coach me if I took 30 years <laughs> worth of of uh yes. <laughs> of, of of studying under whatever coach that I could? Yes, I'm not a basketball coach. I'm a basketball fan. I want us to win, but I'm not going to hop off of a of a thing and say, "Well, we just got to fire the guy." Yeah. Now, I Dan has a 3-year contract, and we're going to honor that contract, you know? It is up to Dan and us to decide if he wants to retire or move on. That's one thing. If we want to fire him, that's one thing. Uh, if we want to make him a special assistant to write out the rest of his contract, that's one thing. But it's not the fans to just say, well, this is what I want, so it's going to happen. But you have to understand the likelihood, like you said last night, of us firing and paying the next two years for a buyout and then bringing on someone else, and it's not just the head coach because the head coach isn't going to come in and say, well, yeah, I'll, uh, just for you guys, I'll let you keep these current contracts that you have for all these assistants and everything. They're going to bring their own people in. It's a lot of money to go around. So I will ask every single person that had put that on there last night that, hey, we've got to fire Dan, got to fire Dan, got to fire Dan. Are you putting up the money toward the buyout for that, or are you just complaining? And I also am going to say everyone has the right to complain. Everyone has the right to say, I'm not satisfied with this record. I'm not satisfied with this style of play. Whatever you want to do, you have that right. But you have to understand when we say the likelihood of firing a guy one year into a three-year contract 
for the buyout that you would have to pay and then bringing someone else in, it's just not likely. Mm -hmm. That does not mean, like you said, that we're happy losing. I just don't get the mindset. Yeah, it's someone is just waiting for an uh, aha, I gotcha at us because we just happen to be two fans that have a microphone in front of us. Yeah, I mean, but, but it's easy for people to just point the finger. Like you're saying, like, well, you, you, you're you okay with a 12 and 17 record then. No, totally not. not no. Absolutely not. It's no, no fun. You know, it, it's, it sucks to be at the bottom in the standings, no matter the sport. But I just think it's magnified. It, it, it's, it's always going to be, for the most part, football and men's basketball at Marshall for most fans. There's going to be there are plenty of fans that can that actively root for more Olympic sports and women's sports and and other like yeah. they're big baseball fans and, yeah. and football comes second or third. But by and large, it's always going to be football and men's basketball. And I'll tell you what, if if those teams are winning, then they're just happy. Those fans are just happy. And that, yeah. That's what it is. And, and, and a lot of folks say a lot of things. Um, about what uh, Christian Spears should do. This is what you should do. But I tell you what, whenever he's had an opportunity to hire a coach, he's hired a really good one, man. I mean, mm -hmm. he hired Kim Caldwell. Look what she turned the program around in one year, right? Uh, and then it, it can be done. Hired Morgan Zirkle. We're really excited about softball. Hired Beals. We're really excited about the future of her baseball. Drop right? us some O's in uh, women's soccer. I mean, right. we're... We got Keith Robertson now doing a uh, an actual split of how it is and having a director of track and field. So, yeah, he's he's made good decisions on here. And somebody uh, is is just going to say. I don't like it because of this. I don't like it because of that it's your right. But just because the the thing comes into your head and you put it on Twitter or Facebook doesn't mean that that is a hundred percent correct and how that it's going to work out. Yeah. It just doesn't. Hey, I have bad takes too. You know, I'm not, I'm not yeah. sitting here saying I'm the only, hey, why'd you say? Yeah, man, come on. I'm <laughs> agreeing with you. Like, so do I. I, no, I, know. I, know, I, know, I know what you're saying, <laughs> but it, it just, the knee jerk reaction is a lot more when you lose than when you go on, if you go on a six game winning streak, Hardly anybody is saying, got to lock this guy up for the next 12 years, man. You know, yeah. we'll never lose another game. You know, I see us uh, winning every single contest. That we no one ever says that. But if you lose six in a row, right now it's five in a row, and those five have not been overly competitive in this. You know, yeah. it, it seems yeah. like some some bad basketball. Yeah, um, it is. It is. That's why it doesn't yeah. have to be one or the other. It yeah. can, it can, you can be really – pissed at having a terrible record and playing bad mm -hmm. basketball yeah but still support the program yeah that's 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 just all it is yeah. look i saw i don't remember who it is i'm not trying to call anybody out because this isn't a call out thing this is just yeah. an, a, an analogy last night i saw on twitter somebody after you know in response to like the women's basketball you know thing that you know they flew home they got home they they put them on the court and then you know they got a little mm -hmm. ovation and everything which was really cool well i saw yeah. somebody say sign coach kim to a lifetime contract that's the same thing you're talking about. Yeah. Right. So what happens the first time she has a six game losing streak? Yeah. Is that are those same fans going to be like, man, what a huge mistake. Now we have her forever. Yeah. See, yeah. you just can't do that. You can't live and die by every loss. Right. Yeah. So and, and I will say, like, you know, people still hang the hat on, you know, some fans are like, well, you know, Dan Tony led us to the first NCAA tournament in however many years. That's that is well, true. And yeah. you can never take it away. But now it's been seven six seasons, years. Right. I mean, yeah. unless Marshall wins the SBC tournament, they're not going to go anywhere close to any type of bid, you yeah. know, for any tournament. So it's now been six or seven seasons. You've had the all-time program leading score during that duration, you know, and, and you couldn't get back to it. Now, look, yeah, and then, and the double-edged sword to that is this is a different team if Andy Taylor doesn't tra transfer. It really is. It's a different team. You know it is. If yeah. Henlockton stays, it's probably a different team. Uh, now, now, of course, that probably means that you don't get Nate Martin to come to Marshall if Hanlockton right. stays. So right. there's a lot of – you can't just always have what you want. You can't always envision yeah. – you can't have this envision of, you know, it, it being um, Taylor and Kerfman and Obina and Martin and Hanlockton as your starting five, right? It wouldn't have been that way. It's like some of those pieces wouldn't have been there if other ones had stayed and yada, yada, yada. But if those two hadn't left, 
this would be a different team this year. That's yeah. easy to say that. And and they left late in the process, and it, it sucked. We knew, we knew that it was going to be a rough season because there just wasn't enough time left for Marshall to to adequately improve the roster versus what left. We yeah. knew it was going to be hard. And look, yeah. it's a rough season, and it sucks. So two games left to go. The best you can hope to do is to get to 14 and 17 in the regular season. Maybe we get a slightly more favorable seating in the tournament and go on a run because all you need is a seat at the table. And if you can go on a run, you can be a 17 and 17 team and make it to the NCAA tournament. Is it a long shot? Yeah, extreme long shot, but it can still uh, happen. The odds are definitely stacked against us. Oh, and God, a, yeah. lo- a, a lot of it is shooting. I mean, you know, you've got the number nine uh, as far as three pointers made. Shooter in Cam Kerfman on our uh, team, usually right around 40%. He's now closer to 30% and may have even dipped below there. He missed 14 or 15 threes in a row. How often has that happened in his career? I would say it's the only time, you know, without having to go through every single game log and trying to count them up. And I'm not just talking about here at Marshall. I'm talking about where he was at at VMI before that. You know, he's been a sharp shooter around 40%. And it just hasn't happened when you're a heavily three pointing three point shooting team and your specialist is missing 14 in a row. Yeah. It's not going to be good. Yeah. You're um, not going to put points up. It's tough. Marshall went three for 23 last night behind the arc. That ain't going to yeah. win you very many games. That's why your point total was 58 or whatever it yeah. was. Yeah. We've been in the fifties uh, more often than not. Uh, over the last seven games and it's just it's tough to see no one is happy but we're also not going to get on our limited uh voice that we have and say hey fire this guy or whatever ain't gonna happen, ain't gonna happen man ain't gonna uh, happen. now what what happens last time i'm gonna say this what happens when you go back and read on the message board or twitter or facebook what you said as a prediction not you but anyone out there what you said coming into this season and you said, I don't know, man, I see us not being a 500 team. And then when we're not a 500 team saying, Oh man, I can't believe we're under 500. You know, either you thought we were going to be good coming in or you didn't, but I've seen a lot of people nearly wishing that we would have a bad uh, team because they were off of the, the Dan Tony uh, bandwagon. And then when it's here, it's almost like they've had that self-fulfilled prophecy sure. that they wanted it to happen. I just can't get that because I want my teams to win every single contest in everything. I want us to go undefeated on every meet of swim and dive. I want us to win every women's golf match. I want us to do everything, man. But I let's, under, let's I never understand the philosophy of, well, I hope my team has an abysmal season because I, yeah. I want I want a new coach. Yeah. Whatever, whatever. Let, let's move on to our final team that is a lot more uplifting to talk about right now. Yeah. Because women's basketball is still killing it. They beat Old Dominion 89 to 75 last Saturday, picked up their 20th win, first time in a regular season since the 90 and 91 season. That's going back now 33 years. Long time. Long time at Texas State on Wednesday. And then they beat uh, ULM 99-90 to yesterday. What happened against Texas State? What happened against uh, ULM? Uh, we got down big. And what, what went on? We won huge or got yeah. up huge. And that is what this team has been known for this year is – Maybe they're missing. Maybe someone comes out and gives their best shots. I like to look at it as someone game planning, and they come out and they, they uh, in football they say, okay, here's our first 15 plays, and they come out and they're doing everything, kind of like what Coastal did to us uh, two years ago uh, at home, uh, that they come out and they do all this plan to get ahead. Well, we can we have shown that we are not afraid to get punched in the mouth. We expect it. Someone's going to come in. We've got the target on our backs because we're the best in the Sun Belt. They're going to come in, give us their best shot, and then we're going to take it. And then we're going to say, okay, now let's not give up. Let's put up a 30 to 8 run. 
let's outscore them 76 to 38 the rest of the game. All these things have happened and go in and just dominate these teams. Yeah. No one no one can keep up with us in the second half because they are sucking wind. They're tired and we are not. We've been doing it all year long. They're doing it one game trying to beat us. We've been doing it all year long. Phenomenal season so far. If if you'll remember, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the the next couple of Saturday games, which turned out to be the Old Dominion game on the 17th and ULM on the 24th. There's, there's two really good teams that we were going to have to go on the road and get wins, and they went into Old Dominion and won convincingly. I mean, yeah. convincingly. And UL Monroe was a little tighter. It kind of got, you know, it got stretched out a little bit at the very end, but it was tighter. Yeah. It was a little tighter. They were, they were a good team too. But I'm telling you, man, it, it's all the things that you just said. It's, it's almost like this team plays possum for a little bit and welcomes the punch in the mouth. And then they get woken up and they're like, yeah, all right. You know, yeah. and then they run away with it. I mean, I know that's not really what it is, but it's kind of what it seems like. Mm-hmm. And then you you take into account that there are players that have been doing it all year, right? Like, mm-hmm. like, uh, like your Abby Beeman's, for example. And then you have other players that are just consistently good. And then there are other players who have just gotten really good over the course of the season. So this is just kind of a perfect storm, you know. This is so, this is so wild. I mean, how many times did we think like, well, you know, we don't want, we don't know what we're going to be. And then, damn, they just kept winning. And they yeah. just kept winning and kept winning and they win convincingly. And they're in the amongst the tops, like top five in the country and scoring. I mean, this team is phenomenal, phenomenal. Mm. And it still stands to reason to me, I, or why I can't, it doesn't stand to reason to me of why we will continually pack in 3,000, 4,000 to a men's game on a team that people are pissed about. But we can't do the same thing about a team that is absolutely dominating the conference. And it's way cheaper to go see yeah. this team too. So yeah. if you're if you just want to go to gripe and moan that to a men's game, that's do that. Whatever, do that. But you can go watch a absolute clinic being put on at the cam when the women's team is on for five bucks, you know, and you've got uh an opportunity to do that Tuesday against uh, Georgia State. Marshall's 21 and 6 now. Georgia State's 15 and 12. Uh, I don't like to give predictions because I'm always wrong. And if I, you know, pick the herd to win, that probably means they won't. But I'm just saying, Marshall's streaking again. Yeah. They've had one bump in the road and they went on a tear again. Yeah. So you get get out to the cam. You you, you get you're going to get to see them Tuesday and Friday. The Georgia swing. The Georgia teams are making the Huntington swing. So you're mm-hmm. going to get Georgia State and Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern, both teams under 500 currently. Both teams. So you're going to get an opportunity, and if Marshall goes out, this is why you should go to the game Tuesday. Marshall goes out and wins, and Troy happens to lose, you're going to see the herd with your own, what? Doesn't matter if Troy loses or not. Oh, okay. Then we go out, and when you see the herd win, you're going to see them clinch a regular season title and probably, mm-hmm. I think, most likely also, the number one overall seed in the com- in, shit, in the Sunbelt Conference Tournament. So that's two great reasons to go out and see them, aside from the fact that they're really damn good, really entertaining, and are just flat around awesome to watch. Here's here's what I have in my head. All right, if Troy, and this is the first couple of things are fact, if Troy loses one of their last two games, we win outright. Okay. If If we win another game, we win outright. But those are facts. Okay. What I believe to be accurate is if we lost our last two and Troy won their last two, we would still be the number one overall seed, I think, because of tiebreakers. Um, We did not play Troy head-to-head, but I believe when it gets to the next tiebreaker that uh, when you look at cross-division, I think, is the next records, I think that we would win no matter what. I think we're the number one overall seed uh, no matter what. We win one more game, we are. Yeah, uh, they they lose one more game. We are so they're uh, going to have this crazy killer instinct on Tuesday to get that taken yeah. care of, handle that. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the video after the game at ULM and <clears throat> the interview, like for the news. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Coach Kim flat out said it. I said it earlier in the episode. We don't want to tie. We want to yeah. win it because if yeah. we tie, that means we both win, and we don't want to both win. We want to win, 
Yeah. And I love that. Dude, it, yeah. that is the type of freaking instinct that I want. And Coach Kim's got it. I think this team has it. They are special. This is an NCAA tournament team, guys. It, it is – I mean, it, it, it – I. Whew. It feels like they're going to be the number one overall seed. They're going to get a bye. They're going to have an easier path to the conference championship tournament game. And it feels like even if they go to the game, to the turn championship tournament and lose it, they still might end up in the field for the NCAA tournament. Now, the best way to, is just take care of business and win because that's all they do right now anyway is win. Go to the game on Tuesday. Go. Pack the house. I mean, this team is – going to control its own destiny for a regular season championship. There is zero reason to not pay the five bucks to go. And then, like we said before, if you've got 10 of you that are going to go get the group rate, go for two bucks. I mean, yeah. you can't, you can't beat it. Pack the house. If you're going to pack the house for a men's team that you're going to gripe about, then you should pack the team for a women's team that gives you nothing to say about them, but good things They you can't find anything wrong with them right now. Started out two and four. I've mentioned this quite a bit. We have gone on a 19 and two run since then, losing to James Madison, who is a very good Sunbelt Conference team. And that was one of the first handful of games since we lost our only uh, true forward, Mahogany Matthews, for the rest of the season. Um, the other loss was on the road to Wake Forest, and it was early in this right. run. Yeah. I think if we play Wake Forest right now, we probably beat Wake Forest. <laughs> I don't care yeah. where we play them. I think we beat them. Well, you also, never know. If you play them early in the season at the cam, you might beat them. And also included in this, what kick-started this 19-2 and two run was a 91-88 to 88 victory over Florida at yep. home. That's right. So uh, we have gone 15-1 and one in conference. Uh, if there is anybody, any coach gets a coach of the year vote over Coach Caldwell in the Sun Belt Conference, they need to have their head examined. It's because very, we're not voting for ourselves. That's that's why. The, the very the very first. Well, I would still abstain. You know, in that situation, I was like, I'm sorry, I'm awesome, uh, but no. When when you look at what everyone was saying, us included. I kept telling everybody, do not expect to win the first game or the first, uh, you know, no matter what yeah. the hype in year has one. been. Yeah, in year one, you're not going to have that. We brought in different key players uh, that had to be put into the rotation. We brought in an entirely new 40 minutes of basketball. You know, we're not talking about, well, the defense stayed the same or, you know, because we played a 2-3 zone, we're going to play a 2-3 zone. Everything is different. Every single thing is different. And she came in here, and I put this out on Thundercast.online, a plug for my article, the last one that I wrote about women's basketball. Uh, yes, we care about all sports. We have now lost 40% of our starters from earlier in the freaking year. Mm -hmm. one of those was our leading scorer last year and the leading scorer for the first six games this year. And since then we've gone 19 and two. The other one was when Mahogany Matthews went down and I don't have the number of games that that's been, but we've lost one. And that was to James Madison. Yeah. One game. And we are now down two of our five starters and we're coming in going on the road and saying, can't no one beat us. Yep. This is just an amazing team. And that's why we continually have put them last on our around the herd. But that now takes care of our around the herd segment. Man, what a what a great way to end it, man. This women's basketball team, they're just fun to freaking watch. And by the way, Rashala Scott, I saw that she committed to James Madison. Yeah. So, so we'll that'll add this, a little yeah. add a little drama to the next uh, basketball season. That'll be yep. uh something to keep an eye on. Anyway, get out Tuesday to the damn basketball game, would you? God, if I could be there, I would be there. But I cannot be 880 miles away and just head up to a basketball game. But, and it would be awesome to be able to be in that environment, to see them secure a championship season. God, and an, and a, and, and a you know, top seed. I mean, what, what else can you ask for? All that for five bucks. Plus you get to watch a really talented team play. Yeah. So I got nothing else, man. If you got anything, uh, you take us out of here. Yeah. So I do have a little something and uh, I just want to congratulate you. 
part of the reason that uh, that you were gone, man. Uh, congratulations on the addition to the uh, family, and uh, I'm just I'm happy for you, and uh, just want to give you a shout out. Well, I appreciate that. It was a fun trip up to North Carolina to uh, see our growing family. Um, we are very, very blessed, and my wife is over the moon, as you can imagine. Um, yeah, I can. <laughs> no, I I, no, I did not have another child of my own. I'll put it that way. So I've, I've, I've fielded a lot of uh, grandpa jokes here in the past week or so, but Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, it was, uh, that's what I said. I, I had an upper respiratory infection earlier and got over that just in time to maybe like the day after, or two, uh, you know, two days after I got over that, you know, we got up on like a Saturday, I think it was, or Sunday. I can't remember. And my wife was like, we got to go. We, we, we got to go to North Carolina right now. And I was like, so we hopped yeah. in the car and we took off, but yeah. thank you. It, it's, it's been a blessing and the kids are happy and everybody's healthy and, and, um, you know, my wife gets treated to pictures and video every day and yeah, really, really cool. So it's good to be back, but it's all, it was also good to get away and, and experience that. So, um, I appreciate that. So take us out of here. All right. Whether you see us at the, uh, Joan, whether you see us at the dot, whether you see us at the Jack coming up on Friday or whether you see us at the cam on Tuesday where I hope to see every single one of you no matter where I see you we'll be saying go herd go herd it's the Thundercast we'll see you next week later <laughs>